This is a digital music trends coverage of Medium 2014, an interview with Martin Frascona from Frascona Law. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the delivery platform used by leading independent labels, distributors and aggregators around the world on ci-info.com. Hi Martin, it's great to have you uh, here at uh, Medium 2014. How's it going? It's, I'm glad to be back. I'm working off 36 hours without sleep, so this could get really interesting. So I really, I really appreciate that. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a tough call, and it's, uh, it's quite late in the afternoon as well. So uh, congratulations on, on keeping it together. <laughs> so Finally got out of Atlanta, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> That's great. And so uh, let's start with an introduction of uh, Frascona Law. Uh, what, what do you do? And what, what, what? Uh, I can't claim the name. It's actually a family firm. So my father is, is the Frascona on the sign. He's practiced entertainment law for 39 years, but it's the only thing that I grew up around. Um, everybody kind of has different uh, backgrounds in, in in the legal world. Mine is with uh, working with international artists. So currently my, my clientele spans uh, 34 countries and six continents. So it's a very interesting kind of mix and luckily not something that a lot of uh, uh, attorneys kind of focus on international aspects. Absolutely and that's something I try to do on the show as well. I try and involve as many people from uh, uh, different continents as possible because usually the conversation is always based around UK, US, maybe Europe, uh, and nobody ever thinks about Asia or South America. There's, there's other things out there, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about you know some of the uh, business challenges when we come to the internationalization of uh, music and uh, especially when it comes to digital, uh, digital services. So uh, we're seeing a huge amount of uh, attention uh, paid by uh, players like Spotify and Deezer to being international players, but then again, uh, often, often time, uh, you know, we don't see the same propensity to have a really international catalog. Like, you know, it's really difficult for them to go out and license uh, their the proper catalogs from local labels. So, when you work with local artists, you know, how much uh, uh, are they paying attention to being present on those services, and is it? Is it quite seamless for them to actually be able to make deals with uh, with bigger streaming companies? Yeah, interesting question. I'll probably spin it a different direction. Sure. So it's um, a lot of the international clients that are represent vary in scale. So I think it kind of depends on where are they? Are they signed with a major? Are they an independent? Are they looking to kind of grow an international fan base? Uh, in 2012, I did a lecture here. It was international strategies for emerging artists, um, and it was interesting because everybody's kind of gravitated two years later to the Jay Z Samsung model about how he was able to push a million albums. I believe before the, the, the release date. Oddly enough, that's something that the independent kind of global community has been doing for decades. And, and ironically, they monopolize that industry. So a lot of what independents are doing, not only do they have to be affiliated with the correct streaming service based upon where they're located and where they're expanding, they also need some sort of non-traditional strategy on how to expand their music into other countries. Um, for instance, uh, there was an artist that we worked with. She was based out of uh, Stockholm, Sweden. She was a country artist. Um, this was probably five, six years ago, so country wasn't a big uh, genre there. And what we did, we ended up um, kind of partnering her with the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce, which ironically is a massive organization within the States. And um, she couldn't have any distribution. No distributor was interested in her within the U.S. There was no label that was interested because she couldn't document sales. Um, so we were able to broker this deal with the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce where we could specifically focus just on Swedish Americans, show that there was a Swedish American fan base, there was a country buying Swedish American fan base, and that was able to kind of progress her album uh, where she would generate sales within the States, tour, and then that ultimately progressed to a deal with Warner some four or five years later. So. Um, independent artists are constantly looking for visibility platforms and I think that's really the main uh, goal when you're talking about the international community one where's the scale are you dealing with somebody that's a major recording artist obviously there's other people that are going to assist with that a majority of who you're dealing with are independent artists yeah. so they need to develop these strategies on how to push things themselves sure. and you know when I talk to music lawyers that deal with artists and independent artists a lot directly as well my, uh, I often ask you know at what level you know do you take artists on you know how, how does it work at the, those beginning stages because of course a lot of uh, uh, artists that are starting out might not have the money to pay for a lot from to represent them so how does that work I'm well aware this is going to sound like a shameless plug, and, and it's not. Um, so kind of take it with a grain of salt. I think that that varies on who you're talking to. Um, traditionally, firms are, are very kind of set in their ways in terms of how they have to bill clients. So it's usually a, an, an hourly billing cycle. That would scare me to death if I was an artist, because I think what you need to use an attorney for not only is the legal work, but also kind of create uh, connecting the creative dots and making sure there's a goal for the entire team to move forward. When 
when you look at an attorney, that doesn't financially make sense for an artist. As a, from an attorney perspective, I prefer that I have a client before they have anybody else on their team. Um, the reason so, uh, usually the problems were unraveling. It's a management deal gone bad, or a distribution deal gone bad, or or a label deal gone bad, and we don't we're not able to kind of initiate creative uh, things into the mix. So I, I encourage artists to get legal counsel on the front end. Um, otherwise, we're not uh, you know we're not unraveling a hornet's nest worth of problems. I know that brings some financial constraints. Um, I think it's important to kind of talk to your attorney on the front end. There's several clients that I was just overly passionate about that were literally starting off in their garage, but I love their music. I knew f the financial aspect wasn't going to make sense. Um, so I was able to grow with them over time and, and able to kind of implement some strategies to help them increase their creative income before they could bite off on, on kind of larger projects. So um, short answer, I think that's one of the first entities that you should hire, but I'm also an attorney making that plug as well. So yeah. take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And uh, so you're talking about 34 countries. So uh, I I'm really interested in the international outlook of the music industry. So where are you seeing the most inquiries coming from? Is there a particular uh, area of the world where you're seeing you know, a, a, a buzz about uh, the industry there, about what's happening? Uh, loaded question. So let me... Uh, you know, I've got an artist right now that um, she's done very well in the States and she's she's based in the States. Most of my clients are outside of North America, um, but she's done very well on YouTube and she has over 300 million hits on her YouTube channel. Um, obviously, that has gotten her label attention within the States now, but most of her analytics are coming from Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and it's strange to kind of watch that market take off. Now, from a sales perspective, maybe not the most attractive. From a talent perspective, very, very talented in those areas. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're looking for. The, the, the German market uh, has kind of been an area of attention with U.S. labels lately. Um, Switzerland is a big area. Austria has been a big uh, area. Sweden is now getting on the map. And it's interesting because, as you know, genres change from market to market, from country to country. So whatever you're identifying as pop within the U.S., that may not be what is classified as pop within Sweden. So it's really interesting, um, you know, for artists, the example I typically give, if you're an artist in San Diego and your music may not be selling in San Diego, my question is, why are you trying to plug it in San Diego? The, the appropriate market, the appropriate sales market may be Dublin, Ireland. So the X factor is, how do you move your product to Ireland? How do you generate a sustainable career in Ireland? And that's where you get into kind of the international aspects of what I do. Absolutely, that's 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 quite a, f a fun uh, part of it. But looking at formats as well, you were talking about Germany and and uh, you know Indonesia and uh, uh, different parts of the world have really completely different approaches. And I, I was giving a talk the other day talking about how there's no two countries right now that feel like they have the same type of mu mu music adoption. You know, the stats are sure. different from territory to ter territory when it comes to physical sales, digital adoption, streaming adoption. Their methods of consumption like very widely. So, so do you have to adapt uh, each artist's strategy to the territory where that they're targeting when it comes to also? generating revenues from recorded music sales? Uh, yeah, again, I think it goes back to the type artist and what is their strategy. So right. if they're trying to acquire a major label, obviously you've got an end game in mind there. So how are you trying to how are you trying to generate visibility to get them on the label map in, in a particular territory? But you're right, all the trends are completely different. So um, I did a, an article for, for Meetem, this was maybe six months ago, talking about the Brazilian uh, music trends and the uh, trends in Argentina. Completely different. In one market, uh, you know, artists are found on YouTube. On the other one, they're found on local radio. Um, so you've got this total paradigm shift. If you really have got to understand the market that you're trying to go into, which brings a lot of legal problems as well or legal things you must maneuver um, another example I usually give when I do lectures is you think of just a simple Twitter account yeah. all bands have a Twitter account all bands have a Facebook account you cross over intellectual property borders within seconds the second you take a picture on your Twitter account and you send it off you may have four or five people in different countries retweet that you've jumped over four or five different legal boundaries and four or five different IP laws and you've got to understand what you're dealing with because a lot of times if your end goal is to sign with a label the label wants to acquire the intellectual property as part of their business model so they want to make sure that they can monetize all social media aspects well when they do that 
that, there's typically a, a uh, monetary amount that they'll kind of put forward when they offer uh, to a band. So they'll pay X amount to acquire the social media. When you're dealing with that and you're a band, you've got to understand who owns that social media. The second a label puts down money and says, we'd like to buy that, you don't want it to then be discussed within the band of, hey guys, how are we going to divide this money? And I see a lot of those problems, unfortunately, take place. But then you just add another layer to it when you're jumping over international borders, depending on what are you doing with your social media as well. So it's a, you said fun, I'd say fun sometimes issue to deal with. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy what I do. I really do. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Let's say that. And uh, looking at better work, yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so looking at how uh, artists are dealing with labels, you mentioned the fact that uh, you know labels might want to you know pay a certain amount of money for their bands and social media, uh, uh, and labels are uh, you know we went through a phase maybe two or three years ago where everybody was talking about 360 deals uh, and they're still around uh, I feel especially at major labels uh, uh, but that trend is, is, hasn't taken off quite as much as, as people might have thought so uh, you know what are the latest uh, on, on that front uh, are they having impact internationally on uh, labels abroad wanting to sign artists to 360 deals and if so how are artists handling that how long do I have to answer that question 90 <laughs> minutes 180 minutes. Um, let me kind of backtrack. First, I think people uh, kind of talk about labels and, and they're very anti-label. Yeah. And, I, and I gave a presentation last year about the anti-360 deal. And um, I'm not anti-labels at all, nor was that kind of the premise of what I was trying to communicate last year. Um, labels bring a lot of good to the marketplace. What's interesting now is there's options. And I think when you look at just the traditional deal, which a lot of would say is the 360 deal, which we all know what that is. Um, last year, you had some emerging players that I think quickly got dismissed of this is an interesting business model. This is simply just a niche and they will kind of die over time. And the reverse happens. You had some new labels come on board. Um, probably the one that's that's most well known in the industry is Red Bull Records, Red Bull Energy Drinks. Um, they had AWOL Nation, which suddenly went platinum. And then everybody says, well, wow, this is a legitimate label. The way that they approach signing artists is much different than the way a, a traditional label would go about signing. Um, to kind of articulate this, uh, Hard Rock Records, Hard Rock um, owns all the casinos and hotels and, and the cafes that you see around the world. They started a, a record label two years ago called Hard, Hard Rock Records. Um, and I saw the deal. Um, it was a client of our firm, and at that time, they were the only client signed to Hard Rock Records. And we all kind of scratched our heads when we reviewed this, and we must be missing something because what they're doing is giving everything back to the artist. This isn't just Hard Rock. This is kind of the trend with a lot of these other labels. The way that they can make it make sense from a business perspective is they have other product that they're selling outside of just records. So they want the artist to kind of be the creative engine to talk about their good experience and in return, if Hard Rock is going to see an uptick in their casino gaming or hotel bookings or in their cafes, or if Red Bull is going to see an increased sales in cans of Red Bull, they're going to make more money off cans of Red Bull than they are CDs. So in return, they're almost reallocating marketing dollars by using just an artist as kind of the marketing tool. And in return, they can give the artist so much more. So the artist is going to leave please if they're getting, I'm making up numbers, but if they're getting 15% from a major label, an anti-360 label may give them anywhere from 75% royalty as opposed to 15% because they want them to be happy. You're starting to see more and more of these emerge, which I think is going to have to change the label environment to some degree because as more and more emerge, artists are going to be more aware of some of these options. So they get an offer from a major, then all of a sudden they get an offer from an anti-360 label. Now it's 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 difficult to choose. And I think a long time ago, um, it, it was almost the name alone could strong arm a lot of these deals back into the major label's favor. Now that's not necessarily the case. And you're seeing these pop up all over the globe. So it, it, it started off in North America, but now you're seeing them kind of scattered throughout. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, looking at uh, somebody like Red Bull or Converse, you know, doing those types of uh, commitments to music, uh, they're long-term commitments, and it takes it takes a, lo a long time before people start really appreciating the work that you're doing, and it, you know, starts. Uh, 
smelling authentic in a way, and, and, and fans also embrace it in, in, in that way. So do you, do you think more brands are going to be prepared, given the success of these, of these uh, companies, to get into the music game for the long haul? Or we're seeing a lot of projects that maybe last a year and then get dropped. Uh, you know, do you think there's going to be more interest uh, from now on or for brands to really get involved with music for you know, a 10-year project? I'm going to carefully answer this, although it probably won't sound very careful. I think if you had asked me that six months ago, I would say that the, the non-traditional label and, and kind of that, that merger with artists was a fantastic model. After Jay Z Samsung, which I still think is brilliant, I think you're now going to see an endorsement and branding bubble that's going to burst. And and the the reason I feel that way is. When you look at a Jay Z um, and what they did with Samsung, that entire model is is based upon some sort of monetary exchange. Jay Z is going to give the rights to this for X amount of dollars, and I think you're going to have more labels that are pushing that. And it's a brilliant business model, but unfortunately for independent artists, what they've been doing is is brokering these same type deals, but they've been doing it for decades where it's more we're not demanding X amount in return. We just want visibility, and that visibility from the brand may be able to assist in sales on the back end, but that's all they want. I think with major labels now pushing it or major artists pushing this kind of this partnership where they're demanding X in return, it's going to dilute the market for independent artists. I think there's going to be way too much out there and at some point brands are going to start to back away saying this financially doesn't make sense for us anymore because artists are demanding so much. But it's not the independents, it's more so the major artists that are doing it. And again, I don't fault the business model. I think it's just going to be very flooded at some point. So we're going to have another shift. Sure. I wanted to uh, close by talking about uh, live, and so uh, we're seeing uh, that bands can get can have an influence uh, in a countries who are very far away from their own, uh, as we talked about earlier, and uh, you know they can uh, explode on YouTube in, in uh, random places, really. Uh, so. Uh, how are the financials uh, uh, working out for the artists in, in that case? Are there options for them to you know, go and play in a country that is you know, uh, 12 hours away on a plane without losing money and making it uh, you know, financially viable as, as an option? Yeah, I, I think we're con as, an, as an attorney, you're constantly exploring ways for an artist either to make money or an artist to save money. I think yeah. naturally that kind of comes with what we do. So um, assuming a band has a fan base abroad somewhere, that you, you've got to go there. You can't just live on on the internet. At some point people want to see you, they want to buy music, they want to engage with you at the merch table. Um, one way we're able to assist, and, and this is changing on so rapidly, it's probably going to change again as you and I are sitting here, but we've had artists that are now exploiting global film incentives. And what that is, um, I actually did an article for Meetum. This was something this past year, so I'm sure you can find it on the Meetum blog, but it was um, what you're having independent artists do, and major labels do this as well. Each country essentially has their own film incentive, where they're trying to lure film productions into a particular area. When they do that, um, they usually look at what amount is being spent on that production, how are you using uh, local talent, whether that's local producers, production companies, so forth. And if you're spending X amount of dollars there and the project qualifies as a production according to that local law, you may be able to qualify for X amount going back as, uh, as either a tax credit or just a rebate. On top of that, there's lots of programs where artists can kind of explore what grants can we apply for so we can get to another country. So I, those two aspects alone, one, you can, you, as long as you are going and, and producing a film project in some capacity, that's something that you can kind of leverage to save money or make money, uh, and on top of it, trying to qualify for local grants as well. So those are two options that artists can use to kind of push things abroad. Now, um, those sound simple in theory. They're very complex to kind of push to the finish line, but those are two options, yeah. That's, that's great. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, if you want to find out more about Martin, you're, he's written a, a few uh, million blog posts, so I'll definitely link out to those. Uh, and uh, uh, the website for the law firm is... Uh, Fresconolaw.com. Prescondalaw.com. Uh, it's uh, fantastic. Uh, great talking to you. And if any artists uh, or anybody wants to get in touch with uh, Martin, yeah, I'm sure you'll find all the details on the company's website. Thanks so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And this has been the DMT coverage of Medium 2014. You can find all the information on digitalmusictrends.com or youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. <laughs>